This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by writer-director Riley Stearns of The Art of Self-Defense, which is playing at SIF now, and presumably wide soon enough. Um, and it's a, I don't know what you go, a dark comedy starring Jesse Eisenberg, and that's where I sort of want to start, because, I mean, I love comedy, don't get me wrong, but like dark comedy is one of those things that feels very hard to do, and, um, like dry humor and stuff like that. How do you sort of balance that as you're making a film? Because it feels like it's very easy for it to be too dark, that it's no longer funny. Like you could, you could have made this film literally the exact same things, but if you tonally try to make it slightly different, it almost be like an incredibly dark film. So how do you sort of balance that humor versus darkness while getting the tone that you actually want it to come out as? I mean, that's a that's a that's definitely a big question. I feel like it's the stuff that I'm drawn to. I've always been into those types of films more than anything else. Uh, but that's easy. Like, a lot of people are into those types of films. It's not necessarily... It's, like, it's phenomenal, but yeah. it's, it's hard to do. It's like, I love the Coen brothers, but I'm not them. Uh, like, it's, it's... Everyone has their own thing that they're good at. And I think I realized pretty early on uh, while I was figuring out what type of filmmaker I was, I made this short called The Cub mm. that it's only five minutes long. It's incredibly simple. We shot it in half a day. But I just kind of trusted the simplicity of it and the, uh, the like, I guess, directness of it and em embraced, just embraced the challenge of straddling that, that, that line. And the way that it worked was kind of perfect. Uh, it's exactly what I wanted and people responded to it. And I think it was just uh, a huge vote of confidence that the way that I wanted to go about things worked. Um, I, I, had I made The Art of Self-Defense or written that after The Cub, no one would have made that movie. Like this script is ridiculous and the fact that somebody actually wanted to make it, even after I made another movie is, is crazy, but I did, uh, so I, I wrote this movie called Faults and I, I ended up directing it and that was my first feature. And that one, I, I would say even though it's very weird and it's very dark and it's, it's also comedic, um, it's a little bit more straightforward well, definitely more straightforward than self-defense. And and I think I needed to do that to kind of prove to people that I, in a full like feature narrative that I could handle that. And the fact that I was able to make that and make it in a way that I think most people responded to in a positive way uh, gave my producer, Andrew Korshak, the, the confidence to say, the script is ridiculous, but I think we can make the art of self-defense. Well, that, that, that raises a, a great question as I'm sitting here listening and think about it. Um, it's, it's a genre that feels like it'd be very difficult to write and then sort of have people understand it as you've written it because it's like so much of it is emblematic of the way people look, the tone in which they say something. Like mm -hmm. it very easily feels like if I handed you a script like this and I'm like, this is a comedy, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Or if you handed me a script and be like, this is a super dark drama, I'd be like, oh yeah, I totally get it. So it's sort of like how, I mean, is it just in being very careful in terms of selecting the people you work with who are able to pick up on those cues naturally? Or is it like you have to explicitly be like, this is a comedy. I mean, it's honestly having somebody just believe that you know what you're talking about. Because with Andrew, who ended up producing the film, I think he loved the script from day one, but uh, a lot of other people liked the script, but just, I think, didn't trust that it could work mm. or that there were too many variables that could have it, that, that could fail. Uh, and they weren't wrong. Um, I mean, it is... It is still shocking to me that, that it kind of came together the way it did, but I just didn't let people say no to me. Like if, if they said no, I was like, well, you're, you're wrong and I appreciate you like sharing. reading it and sharing that, but I'm gonna make it. Mm -hmm. And like I, I had somebody uh, who, who's a very good producer say, you're gonna have a hard time making karate seem cool. And even that I was like, did you read the same script that I, like, this isn't, I'm not trying to make karate cool. Like, it's it's definitely a movie that happens to have karate in it, and it, but it's not a karate movie. It's not trying to make it, like, this really, really cool, like, uh, karate's, like, the cool, like, uh, it's the 80s all over again. It's Karate Kid. Uh, it's not yeah. that. It's it's doing its own thing, and karate's just uh, a means to an end. Well, that's the bigger question of commerce versus art. Yeah. And that's, like, a tough one to balance. I mean, fundamentally, I guess, as a director, you know, you're responsible in terms of a film being successful at a certain level. But again, like, what is success? Is it financial? Is it artistic? Like, yeah. where does that sort of draw the line? And how much of it do you sort of weigh when you're like, 
I have a vision for this project, but at the same time I have to make it X amount of commercially viable or something like that. How do you sort of weigh that balance as you're going to these projects? Um, well, I think I also, like, I genuinely come at f my films from a place of this is going to be very me and it's not going to kind of pander to people, but I want people to enjoy the movie and I want my producers to make their money back. Nobody, you don't have a career if nobody sees your movie. It's very easy to, like a lot of directors do this and especially early on in their career where they're like, they, they're coming off of something hot and they're just like, I, I don't care what other people think as long as I'm happy. Like I made the movie for me, not for other people. Mm -hmm. I made the movie that I want to see, but I also want people to see that movie. So that's important to me. And I think that it comes across when I talk to producers, like I'm making a movie that I hope will uh, kind of appeal to a certain audience, but also a m bigger audience can say, this is enjoyable for me too. And it's not something that I would normally seek out, but I'm glad that I saw it. So I'm always thinking that way. Is it tough to find producers who sort of embrace that mentality? Not to say like that you're not trying to make movies, you're just trying to do your own thing or whatever, but just sort of the idea of like, I want to make this artistic expression that I would like to see. It might not be, you know, fucking Transformers, yeah. but it's going to make some money. Is it hard to find people who are like, look, I don't need to make a billion dollars on each film. I just want to make some money and let's make cut, good Let's art. break it's even, like, even. Yeah, exactly. Like that's, that's, it's, it's such a crapshoot with indies right now where even great indies don't make money sometimes. And uh, even people are saying the book smart's going to like do fine. But I think it, even that went below expectations based off of what I've heard, which is fucking crazy because that movie's so good well, it's, it's and it's so like marketable. Technology. Like I work in technology and it's sort of one of those things that's like nobody wants to invest in something that's like it'll make a modest profit. Everyone's like it needs to be worth 80 billion dollars yeah. and so it's sort of like how does one sort of find that group of people who are like I want to do this. It doesn't need to be like a fortune or something like it's, that. I, I, honestly, I don't know. I've been very lucky that I found two producers, or I guess two production companies who have done that for me now with two films. So Keith Calder and Jess Calder mm -hmm. at Snood Entertainment made Faults, which was my first feature. And they took a chance on me with that. That was a very low budget indie and it totally straddles some lines that people were uncomfortable with. I think I remember uh, a friend of mine who's a, a talented writer saying, he was talking to an agent uh, and that person was like, oh yeah, that, that's a, I read that script that your friend wrote. And he goes, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? And that person was like, funny? No, it's like super dark and scary. It's like a horror movie almost. And he's like, no, it's hilarious. And that's that's a funny thing, like kind of what you're going to yeah. saying. But then Andrew Korshak read this and uh, I, I don't know what he saw in it, but he saw something. And uh, I, I, another producer, I remember reading this script uh, before Andrew officially signed on, said, who's, who makes great stuff. This producer was like, I really love this script, but I need to make money on my next movie. And I said, I totally understand. This probably isn't the project then, I, but I appreciate you considering it. And now it's funny because Bleecker Street ended up buying the film before we even made it. Wow. So it, it, yeah. that part was already taken care of, uh, but it was a risk then for Bleecker Street. Mm -hmm. So Bleecker Street then took on that risk and now they're hopefully gonna see some rewards in the sense that at the very least that people are talking about it and, and it has a chance. It's like. It's hard to break out as an indie. A lot of indies feel yeah. the same. And I, I didn't go out and say, I want to make something different. I just, that's what I like. This is a cross section of my brain. And the fact that people are responding to it is icing on the cake. Um, but I, I'm not, again, not pandering. Um, yeah. What is it like in terms of like casting a project like this? I mean, you got a phenomenal cast in this film. How difficult is it to find the people who are able to understand what you're trying to achieve and at the same time I'm sure there's pressure to get like oh you need to get a certain amount of star power versus like trying to find the people like there's some great small parts in this film from people I wasn't familiar with that really helped make it sort of as engaging as it is like his friend at the karate studio sure yeah, where it's 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 sort of one of those things of like how do you sort of balance the that sort of commercial aspect but also finding those notable people, I mean, obviously Jesse Eisenberg, et cetera, are very talented individuals, but they clearly are able to buy into your vision. It feels like it's probably not the easiest thing to pitch to major stars, but at the same time, if you're able to find the right ones, like it's something that's totally up their alley. Yeah, I mean, Jesse kind of came about 
Uh, like I, I initially thought of Casey as being a character more in his 40s, so I wasn't even looking at people in Jesse's age group. I was looking at an older, like a, a little bit older than Jesse, um, because I just thought it would be a little sadder if somebody in their 40s didn't feel like a man and was yeah. taking up karate and wearing a white belt in a gi when <laughs> punching and kicking teenagers. Yeah, that, yeah. And that, that, was, that was my initial idea. And a lot of those guys just were afraid of the role, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like I had one dude write me an email and he had, he had told me, uh, like how much he loved faults and he wanted to work with me and I sent him this script and, and he read it and he sent me an email the next day and said, uh, to be honest, man, I just don't think I can play a weak character right now. And I was like, why are you a fucking actor, dude? Yeah. Like, that's such a weird thing to say to somebody. And I've, yeah, but I, I, I can't blame somebody. Like that's it's, their, I mean, everyone has their reality, own reasons. Yeah, like but, um, but like, I don't know, Jesse, Jesse was one of these people that when he was brought up, it made sense. And then he, when he read it, he got what I was going for, and he just kind of came at it from a perspective of, I think this is really smart, I really love what you're doing, and I don't totally know how to do this, so tell me what you want, and I'll do that for you. And so a lot of in the movie is, is Jesse basically saying, look, this feels uncomfortable for me, or this doesn't feel like I'm doing enough, and at one point, like, I, I had him, he did a take of, of something, and, and he goes, uh, how, how was that? And I was like, can you do a little bit less? Like, let's just bring it back a little bit. And he was like, how do you mean? And I gave him a, he asked for line reading sometimes. And so I gave him a line reading and he was like, oh, interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll try something. And so he tried it again. And I was like, oh my God, that was perfect. And I was like, okay, moving on. And he goes, really? Wait, you liked that? And I go, yeah. And he was like, that was bad acting. And I was like, no, it wasn't. It was perfect. And he's like, no, that was bad acting. It took a lot of trust on his mm. end. And uh, I'll forever be in debt to him just like trusting me. Well, that's, that's a great, that's sort of a great question of like, I mean, indie films are notorious for short shooting schedules and stuff like that. And for, how do you go about sort of establishing that trust with somebody like Jesse? Like, I mean, obviously it was cultivated and it paid off mm -hmm. in this film, but how do you sort of like create that trust in a very truncated sort of amount of time? I mean, he's a pro, so he's done this a million times. Um, this is only, only my second feature, but uh, I, my ex is an actor, and so she, I was always around her, and I, I, I think the biggest takeaway that I got from being around her was it's not as much about re rehearsals, it's more about conversations. So Jesse and I did sit down several times prior to, I guess, in the two months leading up to pre-production. Like, he signed on in... Jul early July, maybe late June of 2017. Wow. And we were in Kentucky prepping the movie on August 11th. We had a month of prep and we started shooting on September 11th, 2017. That is a crazy truncated yeah. period of time, not only to work with actors, which is like its own animal, but to like handle all of the logistics of putting together yeah. a movie period in another state in like, yeah, in a small town. Wow. Uh, but Jesse and I had those conversations and we, we, we kind of just like, it, 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 more than anything, it was, it was trust on his end. Mm -hmm. Like I have to trust the actors to kind of get what I'm going for and, and like deliver what I need delivered. But Jesse really had to trust me and say, this is obviously a specific vision, so what do you need from me? And I told him what I needed. And he listened, and we did it, and he brought way more than I even imagined was possible. But it was such a collaborative experience. It's it's just like I, I look back on it very fondly. Well, how I mean, as you said, this is your second feature. You're a young director. What is it like in those moments where um, somebody's like, "Oh, no, that's bad acting." At the same time, knowing that like the culmination of a series of decisions is going to equal like a good progress, are there moments where you're like so second guessing yourself? Of, like, no, no, no. <laughs> like I, I, it would be funny because like any other actor says like that was a bad performance just now, and you're calling like you're saying move on yeah. on a bad performance. Jesse came at it from a place of joking. But like also serious in his mind, he was acting poorly. But it's what he understood that that's that's what I needed from that character in that exact moment. So I, honestly, when he said that's bad acting, I cracked up, and I was like, no, we're moving on. Like I, I, I think we had a really good working relationship. There, there was one thing. I'm not going to repeat the joke because it's super personal. But there was this one thing that we said the night before I left for Kentucky. We we're having a conversation. We we're trying to figure out something, and we we're kind of brainstorming about something. And I kind of made an off-color joke about myself. It was like a personal mm. thing. 
and he started cracking up and he was like, I'm so glad you said that. I almost said that three times, but stopped myself. And I think the fact that we we're both, like he admitted that he had been thinking that way yeah, and I just went ahead and said it. Uh, it. It's one of those things that if I could say what it was, it would mean even more, but it's one of those things that's always gonna stick between us. But I, th I think in that moment, we kind of trust, we were like, okay, we're on the same page. Even just little things like that, that could be throwaway moments on, on a dumb phone call at nine o'clock at night, right before you could hop on a flight at 5 a.m. the next morning, that kind of thing sticks with you the whole shoot. And uh, I, I love finding those things that, that you can relate to somebody with. How much of this film sort of came to be in terms of just theoretically just on set during the production? Because as I said, like, you know, with a film like this, seeing the raw script, there's so much like nuance that, I, I mean, maybe you have like incredibly detailed like notes about like characters, mm -hmm. emotions and stuff like that, I don't know. But like, it feels like so much of that you sort of capture there either in your head or just sort of feel it out as the performers are doing it on camera. Like how much of that was sort of like cultivated during that actual production process? Because it feels like a film like this to me is one that either would be most sort of coming together during the production process or theoretically during the editing process because there's so much that would be hard to write down during the I mean, scripting process. I don't write backstories for characters. I think the back, the most that I had was for Jesse's character, Casey, was that he probably was married at some point and divorced, mm -hmm. um, or at the very least was in a long-term relationship and that fell apart and he's just kind of kept to himself ever since. I, f I don't feel like he's ever belonged to a group and partly why he found this this uh, kinship in, in this dojo and and in and, and this like father figure in sensei. Um, but as far as the script goes and the way that the movie's put together, I, I think that I think that everything that's in the movie is in the script. Like wow. I Alessandro, I'm not like kind of claiming credit for like I'm not, I'm not trying to like toot my own horn. Alessandro said in an interview during South by that he's never made a movie where he read the script and saw the movie and they were as close as they are in this. Well, I mean that- Which is a huge compliment yeah. to me. Like it's, it's, it means a lot because there's so many crazy things in the movie that somebody might be like, oh, that had to have been like an improvised thing. But there, it's just, it's very, we're just, we're deliberate. And we, I knew what I wanted and there were things that didn't work once we got there on the day and we had to kind of figure out an improv, uh, like a solution to. But I always, I, I think the script was always my blueprint. And um, in particular, there's a moment where, uh, uh, like, the, oh, and like in this, I guess I, maybe I don't want to go down that road because it's a little spoilery. There's there's a moment where, have you seen the film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's a moment where uh, I'll say a character uh, is told your other left, and they this, this character does a double take, <laughs> and that's in the script. And I think as I was writing, I was like, I don't know how we're gonna figure that out, but we will. And we got there and I was talking to the, this, this other person and they're like, oh no, here's how we do that. And I was like, great, we, we're doing it. And now it's in the movie and it's one of the funniest things in the movie to me. And it was just like this thing as I was writing, I was like, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but we're gonna make it work. And, and like problem solving is fun for me. Um, awesome. and, and going in with a plan, but also being willing to, as a director, play around. Like, I don't let my actors play around too much because the dialogue's pretty sure. specific. Uh, but I, I myself, like, I'll have a rudimentary shot list, but sometimes I'll throw it out. Uh, my production designer doesn't always like not having a shot list. You can uh, imagine that, yeah. Charlotte, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I don't like shot listing is because it's fun to get in the room and see what the actor's doing with what your, your like the context of the scene is and what the, the lines are, and then getting to say, oh, it'd be really fun if we shot from this angle, actually, or it would be really fun if, if we didn't cut away on this moment. And, and yeah, that's, that's where I get to improvise. That's awesome. So the film is playing at SIF. It's been bought by Bleecker Street. Bleecker Street's in releasing the future. July future, 12th. Future. Okay, tw July 12th. Is there a website or anywhere that people should go to keep tabs on all things? I mean, the, the easiest answer right now is just my Instagram. It's so stupid. You don't have to follow me. <laughs> I'm such an idiot on Instagram. I, I'm sorry in advance. It seems like more incentive to follow you if, I, if you ask me. Yeah, I just dyed my hair the other day or like bleached it too. Respect because I'm that. like, why not, man? Like I'm just trying to have fun and be myself. So you can follow me on Instagram and I talk about the movie and try, I try to like not be a commercial 
like where I'm just talking about the movie constantly in a mm -hmm. really boring way. Um, but I do mention all of our festival releases that oh. are coming up. I talk about all the international things. Like anytime I see something pop up on Google, I let people know that it's official. Um, but that said, there will be an official Bleecker Street uh, website popping up soon. You can go to Bleecker Street's full on bleakerstreet.com, whatever it is. Um, and they've got some stuff. I, I feel like I'm, I'm the most uh, in-depth in the way that I talk yeah, about the movie. And hopefully a little fun, too. Um, and so what is next for you after this? Have you started thinking of next, or are you just like, I need to get this out there? And yeah, that? so a thing that I... I think that I did, and I, I don't regret it because I think that it was important for my process at the time. Was I made Faults my first feature in 2014? It came out, or sorry, 2013. It came out in 2014 at South by, and then was in theaters in 2015. So that was already like two years or so worth of wait between 2000. 14 at South by and 2019 at South by for these two films. That's a five-year gap I don't ever want to wait that long between features again mm -hmm. at the time I just wanted it was my first feature and I was like I may never get to experience this again I want to go to film festivals and I want to travel and I want to enjoy the process I'm now really motivated just to keep working and making stuff that makes me happy and That's awesome. directing is fun So I have another script that I've written I've got producers attached I can't mention wow. who they are yet, but they're dope they make really good movies and it's called dual d-u-a-l uh mm, and it is a like pseudo sci-fi film uh that has cloning as an as an element and it's a female lead and okay. it's going to be pretty awesome in in my opinion phenomenal well uh good luck with everything related to this i hope people check it out it is very entertaining Thank um you. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank awesome. you so much for doing I really appreciate it. Thank you. T-1000 can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to buy the sign style. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels all right.